I want to officially say hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't already know me, I'm Kristen Bramstad, and I am the program manager for the Oregon Department of Forestry's Urban and Community Forestry Assistance Program. Thank you for joining us. While everyone is getting, you know, logged in and settled, I'd, I'd like to spend the next few minutes talking about the Oregon Tree Flutter Inventory Project. The Oregon Tree Flutter Inventory Project is the result of a vision that we had in the Urban Forestry Program to make free tree inventory mapping and mapping software available to all Oregon cities. Not only so that any city that wants to inventory its trees can access a high quality inventory platform, but also so that we can have a statewide database of trees from across the state. We chose the Tree Flutter Inventory Platform after an extensive, and believe me, it was extensive, <laughs> RFP process and viewing demonstration by all proposers of their software with a committee of experts and stakeholders both inside and outside of the Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, let's see what else I'd like to say. Um, it's hard to understate the importance of having a mapped um, Tree inventory, once your city decides to take the management of its public trees seriously. And after all, how can you wrap your head around managing something that you don't already, you know, that you don't know what you have? A tree inventory is a first step towards managing your city's trees proactively instead of reactively. The prospect of having a statewide tree database is also exciting. When emerald ash borer or some other invasive insect gets to Oregon, and note I say when and not if, it will be helpful to query the database and see where the target trees may be and plan a statewide response to the pest. With a statewide database, we can also view tree trends, such as the average condition and age of trees in cities, which in turn may help us make the case for funding a tree planting initiative or something like that. The other part of our vision is all about improving and extending the state urban forestry programs technical outreach to cities because the tree plotter platform allows urban forestry staff to work with individual tree managers from our respective office computers. We will be able to view your city's tree inventory data with you and discuss with you what we see and how it may relate to your urban forest management plans. Of course, even if your city does not need our, our assistance, the tree plotter inventory platform will allow your city to create and expand its own tree inventory for its own use. The tree data is yours, and every tree that you add to your city's inventory also adds to the statewide tree database. If your city already has an inventory, you do not need to change your inventory software if you are happy with it but we ask that you consider sharing a copy of your data so that we can add it to the statewide tree database to strengthen it. And we can still discuss your inventory data with you if you want. So these are the basic ideas behind the project. If you have not already done so, I encourage you to read the FAQ document on the ODF Urban Forestry website. And I'm gonna to try to, to share my screen right now to do that. And it looks like this. Okay, so you can see that. Yep, we can see that. Okay. And then, let's see, get back to my other screen here. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, and so you can also see if we, if we open this up what this document looks like. Okay, so this document will answer lots of um, questions that you, you may have about this project as we go through it. You can see that it's several pages and it's set up to answer some questions for you. Um, and the way to get there you know, is, is very easy. Um, you know, search on Oregon Department of Forestry and then Urban Forestry and it'll be right at the top of the page as you can see. Um, so obviously, uh, our vision depends on cities like yours to see the value of inventorying their trees. So this is why we're here today. If you would 
If you like what you see, please tell other Oregon communities. This project, this vision is only as good as the city participation we can encourage. So I think probably by this point, many more of us have logged in. So let's switch gears and I'm gonna give you a quick introduction. Okay, Charlie? Yep. Okay, our host today is Charlie Flesh, who is the head of Tree Plotter Customer Support at Planet Geo. Planet Geo is based in Arveda, Colorado, near Denver. Charlie will be demonstrating some of the basic tree plotter functions today, and then we'll be returning next week to show more things that the software can do and to answer your questions. He will also show you how to access a test site that he has set up so that you can play with the software yourself after this presentation. If you have questions about what you're seeing, and you know, while Charlie is doing the presentation, please send it in a, um, send it through that uh, Q&A um, link down below. Um, and let me know if you think it's necessary to interrupt Charlie for clarification. And if not, what we'll do is we'll stop near the end of the presentation and we'll go through them for a few minutes to, to have Charlie answer them as needed. So uh, I think that's my spiel. So without further ado, why don't you take it away, Charlie? Sounds good. Thanks, Kristen. Uh -huh. Let's see if I can take over your screen share. Oh, I think I need, to, I need to stop sharing. Hang on. My other screen. There you go. Okay. Let's see. Can you see that now? Yes, I can. Okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and we'll assume everyone else can as well, since they can't speak. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. Kristen again. Um, I am gonna quickly, um, probably for the next 30 minutes or so, go through some of the basic tree plotter functionality we have set up here for the Oregon statewide app. Um, first thing to go over is the URL. Um, and this is the URL for the application. It's pg-cloud.com backslash Oregon. Um, you can access this uh, site on any browser or device. You don't need to download an app. If you're on um, a phone or a tablet, you will just go to um, the browser that you have downloaded. We do recommend Chrome or Safari, um, and then just type this URL into that web browser and you'll reach this page here. Um, you can see that I'm actually not logged in um, at this point, so this is actually the screen that everyone will see. Um, ever, all of these yellow points represent a different city um, and inventory data will live within um, each one of these. Right now we have been um, working with uploading Portland's data, so let's, if you just click on it, you can click load trees and just take a look. Let's see what it looks like right now. Um, we'll see the trees will come in. Right now there's actually 118,000 uh, trees loaded up into the Portland um, site. Um, it'll only, the system will only show you 2,000 as, at a time just to save, um, just kind of speed things up so it doesn't get bogged down. Um, but we do have 218,000 trees loaded in here. Um, and just for the public's view, it's, you can see the tree points in here. Um, you can also click on the tree points and get a few of the data fields about the tree um, that we have set up, um, but they can't get at the additional um, details of the tree. It requires a login. Um, they also can't add or edit any of the information. Um, so there is some um, uh, availability by the public to view the data, but it's just um, some of the more basic information. So let me go back to our home screen and kind of walk through um, logging in, um, adding data, uh, and then some of the other functionality. So once you get uh, to the tree plotter page, you are gonna click up here, log in. Um, I'm gonna use this uh, demo login that Kristen mentioned, and we're also, I think the best thing to do is we'll send it out um, in the email after the webinar, the, login and password information that you guys can use to log in and um, test out the system. So let me put it in here. Um, 
Okay. Once we're logged in, we are zoomed to the um, site for the test data. Um, you'll notice when I clicked on the Portland one, we zoomed over to Portland. Um, in this case, we're just in the middle of Oregon here um, where we saved the test data site. Um, let's go over here. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna go over is what we call the interactive legend over here on the far right of the page. Um, this kind of um, is your guide and orients you to what you're seeing on the map. Um, at the top, you'll see the layer we're looking at is the trees layer. You'll either be looking at the trees layer or those yellow dots of the cities. Um, so right now we're loaded into the demo test data tree. So we're on the trees layer. Um, you can display by your trees um, with different uh, attributes. So right now we're, if we had, if we were looking at trees, um, it would be color coded by species, but you can also change that to condition, DBH, genus, or status, or land use. Um, there also is an option to show the different tree points as um, sized based off of their DBH, so the bigger DBH will give a bigger um, dot on the map, which would be under this symbology option. Um, and then going down, um, this will count up as you add trees into the system. So right now there's just one site, um, and it's actually over here. I just added it in to test over in Bend. Um, so you'll see one point um, on the map, um, and it's on the legend, it's showing one of one site. Um, it's a white dot right now because I haven't specified the species for it. Um, and we are displaying by species. Been, we'll see as we uh, manipulate this data and add more trees in, um, that the colors will come in and, and it'll look a little better. Um, so let's go ahead and add a new tree into the system. Um, we can do that by clicking up here at the top, the add, add tree button. Once I get that, I get a, a quick pop-up, um, choosing which template I want to use, uh, tree, stump, or planting site. Uh, for now, I'm just gonna choose tree. And then I get the option to add by map or by GPS. Um, you can, by map is going to be using the aerial imagery that you see on the screen to place tree points um, based on that aerial imagery. If you do have a GPS device that is pretty reliable, and most um, tablets, phones do have GPS devices that you can use and you can kind of test out if it's gonna be accurate enough for you, um, but it's just gonna be as accurate as the device you're using, um, you can use that by GPS. Um, I'm not gonna click that now, it'll zoom us over to Colorado, but I'll do choose the option for by map. And then, um, once I've done that, I get this um, little cross icon, and anytime I click, anywhere I click on the map, it'll add a tree point. So I can zoom into the map. Um, I'm doing that by just scrolling my cursor wheel. Um, so zoom into an area that I want to add a tree, um, hover over it, and then click. Once you've added that tree point, you'll get your tree details pop up. Um, and these are um, all of the information and attributes about that tree. Uh, you'll notice right away that some of the information just automatically gets pulled in for you. Um, these, this address information is all pulled directly from um, Google when you add that uh, tree point. Um, the rest of these fields were all um, fields we decided on with Kristen and her team. Um, it just kind of some generic fields that will be good um, across the board. Um, we have, uh, there's some text fields where you can type directly in, um, checkbox fields, the radio buttons are fields where you can just select one option, um, drop down fields, um, and then some grayed out fields that will be automatically populated for you, including lat and long down here. Anytime you make a change into this details form uh, uh, in, the, in the system, uh, everything is just automatically saved. There's no save button anywhere. Um, and any change you made is, is automatically saved, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, there's also these tabs across the top um, in the details form, location, tree, management, and history. 
Um, so this first one that you'll see is the location one, and then you can um, click over to the tree information, enter more detailed information about the tree, um, including um, scientific name, common name here. So let's go ahead and just choose one. Um, again, we are this actually currently working with Kristen to um, kind of solidify an overall species list for Oregon. Um, and once we have that, that will be what's in here. This is um, kind of just a mish mix, mishmash of different species lists right now. Um, but once we have that, it'll be the overall um, species list from Oregon. Um, and so you'll be able to search. You can search up here um, or just scroll through and click one. Um, you'll see that when you choose either scientific or common name, the um, other species fields will automatically fill in um, and populate. Again, um, in this tree tab, we have more fields that you can um, either choose to populate if you have that information or you can just skip over it. Um, let me think if there's anything else. Um, down here at the bottom, there is the option to add photos to the tree point, and that's saved in the system with that specific tree point. Um, if I go over to management needs, um, there's some few options for primary maintenance, secondary maintenance, um, some comments. <laughs> And then down here at the bottom, you also um, have the um, view to see the user who added it into the system. Um, again, I'm just logged in with this demo user, so that's why that's showing up there. And it'll also track the date it was added into the system, um, when it was last modified, and the last modified user to modify the tree. And then finally on the far right is our history tab. Um, this will track inspections to the tree, um, as well as work history um, that's been done. And first, I'm going to go to the work history section here. And if I click add, this just allows you to quickly track any work that's been done to that tree over time. So you can check any, the, any work that's been done. Um, you can change the date if you need to, add any notes, and click submit. And then you'll see that the, these work history activities are just saved in a table for that tree over time. So you can kind of track any work that's been done. And then inspection here. Um, if any inspections had been performed on the tree, we would see them kind of similarly in a data table format um, down here. To perform an inspection, um, all you have to do is click the inspect button. Um, and this would be in a situation where you've inventoried a tree, um, already and then you come back to it a year later, um, some of the attributes have changed um, and you want to save those um, initial attributes but then also update the tree with the most recent information. You can just click the inspect button here. Um, the inspection fields will show up. In this case we have condition, DBH, and tree height. Um, uh, if the DBH changed you can update the value in here. Um, again you have the date uh, the user inspected any notes or photos, and you can click Submit. Once you've submitted an inspection, then your inspection data table will populate with that information. Um, so that all lives in the history section over on the right. Um, you do have options to delete, uh, close out of the details form, just closes out of it. Um, and then finally up here at the top, is the option to load last, which will, if you're inventorying um, an area, it just allows you to load all of the um, details of the previous tree you were working on, um, if you have some similar trees all in a row or all along the same street. Just um, allows for faster data collection. So let's close out of the details form here. And you'll see uh, that my point here has turned red and over on uh, my legend on the right, um, I have kind of a key telling me that the alder is the red trees. Um, and again, still there's a white tree in here, down here at the bottom, that the species is not specified, so it's gonna show up white. Um, let's go in here, click on the point. If you click details, we get back at that details form. Um, so location information, I'm gonna go over to the tree information. Um, and this time add a common name. Um, 
So let's just say Alaska cedar here. Um, once I populate that, the scientific name comes in, genus comes in, um, and then if I close out, we'll see um, that now the system has color-coded the Alaska cedar to be red and then the alder to be that blue. And so as you add um, into the system, the legend over here on the right is just automatically updating and changing based on what you have done and done. Um, so that is the adding. Um, up here in the top right, we also have the option to move trees around if you've accidentally um, put one in the wrong spot. You can um, choose the move button. Um, if you are on a desktop, it's a little bit easier to move the trees because you can just um, drag them to the correct position. Um, oops, let's do that again. You can drag them to the correct position. Um, if you are on a tablet, it um, you can still move trees. It just works a little bit differently. You will click on the tree point that you want to move and then click where you want it to move to. Can't, there's not really the option to drag when you're on those tablet or phones. Um, and then to exit out of move mode, um, you just have to click uh, the move button again and that blue ring around it will close out and then you won't be um, able to move points anymore. Okay, and now I'm gonna go over here, um, what we call the navigation toolbar in this upper left corner. Um, the plus and minus button just help you um, navigate around the map, zoom in or zoom out. Again, um, I, I like to just drag the map around by clicking and dragging um, and using the scroll bar or scroll wheel on my mouse. But you can also use these zoom in and zoom out buttons. Um, this home icon will take you back to your home extent. Um, so this is what we have set as the home extent for um, application. So if you ever need to quickly get back zoomed out pretty far, you can use that um, home extend button. Um, this little crosshairs will again use the GPS of your device um, and try to best find your location. Um, it'll zoom you right um, to where it thinks you are. Usually um, it's pretty accurate, but sometimes it can be off um, by 10 to 20 feet, depending on the accuracy of your device and um, where exactly you are. Right under that is the where to button, the globe. Um, and you can use this to quickly search an address and zoom to an area, um, which can be handy in, as opposed to having to zoom the map into specific areas. You can use uh, that global um, search. Um, under that is um, a little filter icon, which is the advanced filter tool that I'm actually going to skip over for now and come back um, in a few seconds here. Um, but the map icon here is your base map. Um, and we have set up as the default uh, the Google hybrid base map. Um, we find that to be the best tip. There are some areas where you can um, get different, um, so different time of year, or, or sometimes it's even better, more high quality imagery. Um, from this Esri world imagery base map. So you can just choose that and you'll see that the base map switches. Um, and it's worth it to um, test out both for your city or area. Um, these are all kind of controlled by Google and Esri. So um, they update them periodically. Um, so feel free to play around with the different base maps and see what might work best for you. Um, there is also just kind of a very basic um, looking map here, open street map, that you can use as well. So let's go back to Google. And then finally down here at the bottom, this little question mark, if you ever need help um, with the system, if you click that, it pops open this side panel, which um, has a direct link to the Planet Geo tree plotter support site. Um, so if you ever have any technical questions about using tree plotter, um, you can go here and this will load up our support site. You can either kind of click through um, different um, sections down at the bottom, frequently asked questions, or if you just have a question about a specific tool. Um, so if you say you want to 
know about the uploader, um, you can type up here um, and get a quick video on the uploader. We also have articles, walkthroughs um, on basically all of the tools in the system. Um, let's switch back over to the application here. Um, if you do have other technical questions, so related to using the system or application, um, you can reach us by this email um, or phone number or directly type into this form. Um, if you have questions specifically about Oregon's forestry um, management program, you'll probably want to reach out to Kristen. But if any uh, questions about the application or functionality, feel free to reach out to us at Planet Geo. Okay. So I said I would come back to this little filter icon here. And I'm gonna do that now. If I click that, um, this allows me to um, filter on any of the trees in the system. And so this is a powerful tool that you can um, use uh, either logged in or not logged in. Um, anyone can use this tool um, to just uh, filter down to specific trees in their in their map view. So for example, um, I have these fields um, down here at the bottom. If I wanted to filter on the field of condition, I could choose the condition option here. And when I check it, um, all of the condition values um, populate down below. And I can uh, check which ones I want to see. So if I want to see all my trees that are fair, poor, or dead. I just check those options and click apply and we'll see that the map automatically updates to show those. Um, neither of these trees that I had um, added had those values um, for their condition so you'll see that they disappear and over on the right my legend updates to tell me that there's no trees with um, condition dead, fair, or poor in this demo test data. Um, so you can add these filters on top of each other. If I wanted to see um, trees that um, were either dead, fair, or poor condition, and then also specific species values, um, I could also add in an additional filter for um, one species, or you can check multiple um, and apply all of those. You can really get um, pretty complex with the different filters that you can apply. Um, and getting at very specific um, subsets of your data um, using this filtering option. Um, the other is another option if you don't want to filter by a specific field um, that's in the tree data, you can also filter by a map area. And so I'll show that um, after I, if you, at the top here, you can clear all your filters. And we'll see that the trees come back in um, and over on the right, my legend, I am showing two of two trees. Um, and so if I want to filter um, not by a field, but by um, a map area or something that I can polygon that I draw, I can choose tree map filter. Um, I'll get this little blue dot and say I just want this one block or this one specific park. I can draw this polygon, um, do it, make it whatever shape I want. Um, but when I close it again, we'll see that it'll filter down to just the trees within um, that polygon area. And again, over on the right, I'm just seeing one of one um, tree site now. And the filtering is also gonna be important as we get into the more um, complex um, and different tools in the application in terms of reporting um, and the data table, all of that works in conjunction with um, the advanced filter. So it allows you to build out different reports and create exports and data tables based on um, trees that you filter down to um, or just trees, or all, you can do that for trees throughout your city. So there's lots of options um, with the advanced filter in conjunction with some of the other tools um, in the system. So again, I'm gonna open it back up and click clear all filters. Um, one other thing to note about the advanced filter is that um, when you have a filter applied, um, this little box up here will be yellow. Um, and if you click on the little drop down, it'll tell you 
um, what filter you have applied on the map. So right now we have a city filter where the city is just the demo test data. Um, so that's why we're only seeing these two points on the map. If we add another filter in, so for example, let's just do a DBH range. Let's look at just these few small DBH ranges and click apply. My trees will disappear um, since I don't have any within that small range. Um, and if I open up this, um, you'll see that it is showing that it is filtered on the DBH range in addition to the city um, test data. Um, all of the fields in the tree plotter system are able to be filtered on. Um, these are just the most common ones here um, in this pick list here. Um, but if you need to filter on a different field, you can always choose it from this add field dropdown. And it will populate below. Um, we quickly touched on the history and tracking like watering or mulching. Um, you can also filter on um, those activities. Um, so if you wanted to see trees that had been mulched um, within a specific time frame or um, pruned, um, you can add those filters in and that will filter down your map to just those trees as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear all my filters here and close out of the advanced filter. Um, last thing I'm gonna go over today is up here at the top in this um, data button. If you click that, um, you can get at a data, data table view of all of um, your trees. And so this is similar to um, looking at it, um, the information in that details form, but instead of the forms and the, the different points on the map, all of the trees will show up as different rows in this data table. And so in this case, I just have the two rows for the two trees in my test data site. Um, up top, up at the top, we have the columns for the different fields. Um, you can directly click into these fields and edit them. Um, if you like working in the data table format as opposed to working within the tree details form, that is um, possible. Um, and if you need to change the, the views that you're seeing across the top here, um, the fields, you can always go to the views button um, and add or remove fields from the, the data table view um, just by checking them on. So say I wanna see city, um, I wanna see condition, I don't need to see date added or DBH. You just check those on or off um, to be in the table and I can scroll down apply those changes, and now we'll see city and condition in my data table. So the data table is just another way to um, work with the data. Um, if you like that better, you can also export um, directly from the data table into a CSV, which can be brought into Microsoft Excel or a shapefile if you like working in a GIS system. And again, that is all within um, this data button um, here. Um, there are some additional tools um, in this uh, header up here called the hub. Um, dashboard, stats, reports, um, and data tools. We're going to cover all of those um, at our training next week. So be sure to come back for that to go over some of the more um, advanced functionality. Um, the admin section here um, is where you'll log in, log out. Um, if you need to change your password, you can always come here and do that. Um, and then finally at the bottom is that support section. If you have any questions, um, want to just see a quick video on how something works or just read through a walkthrough, um, all of those live on our support site, support.treeplotter.com. Uh, so that's a lot of information. Um, uh, let's stop there. And um, Kristen, did any, do we have any questions come in? I'm actually also going to switch over to look at um, the Portland data again. So, um, Charlie, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I have a quick question just about the, um, the demo that you just did and uh, everybody's access to it. So when, 
when um, when they go to the demo and they see that wide open Oregon landscape there, you know, in the middle of the desert, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. So what they can do is they can add trees to that area. Is that what what that what they can do there, or do they move it around, or what um, exactly can they do? And if whatever they do is that saved on that demo site so that other people will see it and be able to interact with it or um, or not yes so the demo site is just um set up as another city so it's basically just a grouping of all of of trees um where it's located is right in the middle of oregon um, but you can um, zoom out once you um, go into the demo site or when you log in it'll just bring you to this with a demo username and password um, this is just like the home extent of it but you can go ahead and zoom around or type in an address in or find your location to bring you to different areas um, and go ahead and add trees move trees um, you will um, be able to access anyone who adds trees or into this um, test data so you can potentially have someone might change your data if you add it in there, um, specifically for this test site. Because um, anyone with the demo login will be able to see the trees that you add in and play around with them, just since it's all test data in there. Okay, so they can they can go and they can they can move the map over to a, any city, look at that city, pretend to add trees and stuff like that, but that's not gonna screw up any of the city data or anything like that. Correct, yep. It's all within um, a grouping of test data. Yep, so it won't, it's not unrelated to any of the sit other city data. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a little intimidating when you think that you could screw th something up, so. <laughs> <laughs> right, yep, nope, we set it up so you, um, you could screw up other test data that someone had put in, but it's all just gonna be test data, so. Okay, so. Um, a couple of questions we have coming up here. Um, Dwayne asks, can you create a short list of tree species that are common in your area? Yes, that's a good question. And actually, um, as you uh, add more trees into the system, it will start um, doing that on its own. Um, as you um, have more common ones you'll see that you'll get this most common list up at the top of your species pick list um, so it's not actually possible to do that on your own but it'll it'll do it for you kind of as you add more trees into the system for your city yeah i, I also want to add a couple of things one is that was um one of the discussions that we had at the forum the other day uh, and some people asked that specific question and I think Ian is going to start to look into that option um, but then the other thing to know is that when the species list is finalized for Oregon at least there will be the option of of adding in if you don't know the specific ash that you're looking at you can just say ash species or um, pine species rather than having to know the actual um, specific name of the of the tree that you're looking at. So that at least will be available. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. Cindy asks, in the tree information, is there an option to identify a tree as a heritage tree, street tree, and or as having other unique distinguishing characteristics? Um, right now, I'm trying to think if we have that set up. Um, you can always type additional notes about the tree in this other tree observations kind of just open text box. Um, I can't remember, Kristen, if we have anything I, about. Yeah, I think we're going to we're going to add that in. I've talked to Ian a little bit about tweaking that particular aspect because we also will have that tree walk feature to to be mm -hmm. able to do as well. So um, eventually there will be not eventually pretty soon there will be a way to um, differentiate that so that you can sort on them, you can map them, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, okay. Um, another question here. 
about the Oregon species list. If one identifies a tree not on the list when conducting an inventory, is it possible to add that tree species? Um, right now, I think what we're going to do is not allow um, at least all the users to add or edit the species list. Um, I think we'll start with just having the admins of the system be able to do that okay. um, person and then it's kind of up to you over time if um, we talked about um, we're going to have kind of city um, admins and if we want to allow them to add species to the list um, or if they if you want people to email you if they they run into that situation because um, we definitely want to have just kind of a very standard list and not so that it's clean and um, everyone's working off the same one and doesn't get too messy. Right. Um, yeah, I have been working on this list to, to um, just with the, with the data we already have, you'd be amazed at how different the tree lists are from the cities that we've already heard from. So I'm trying to create a very clean uh, list of, of species. And if you know of a tree, that you have um, that's not on the list, please contact me. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about how to add it. And um, also, if you are planting a tree of a known cultivated variety or cultivar, also please let me know. Um, it may not go in right away um, the way it is, but um, I'm just going to be keeping a list of trees that we can update over time. Um, so that's how we'll do it at first. And then um, as things grow more comfortable or whatever, um, we can we can figure out administrative access to do that. Uh, let's see. Here's one from Anonymous. Does the advanced filter utilize the original inventory status and or any subsequent inspection? Inventory. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so in that that case, the question they're asking if I have added a, a tree into the system um, and say at the time I added the tree, um, I entered the DBH as 15. Um, if I then inspect it a year later and the DBH updates um, and I update the DBH to 20 um, with my inspection, is my filter going to apply to that 15 or the 20? Um, and so the advanced filter works with the most recent data. So when I perform the inspection and I say that the DBH has changed to 20, um, it'll actually update in my tree details form here to 20. And that tree officially is known in the system as having a DBH of 20. So that's how the advanced filter, it'll work on that off that DBH being 20. Um, but you can always go back into your inspection history and see in the past what it was before. You can see that 15 value. Um, but the filter will work with the most up-to-date information for the tree. Okay, let's see. Um, Don asks, is it possible to remove or hide the fields that they don't need, that he doesn't need? Um, in this case, it's not going to be possible for the different cities to um, change their details forms. The easiest thing to do will just be to not populate the fields that you uh, don't need, but we're trying to build out this detailed form to just have um, the most important fields um, and ones that will be relevant to the most number of people in cities. Okay. Um, Sue asks, outside of demo, can you set home to a specific area? Um, Outside of the demo, can you set home? So the um, each city will have their own um, kind of home extent, um, and that's where it'll zoom you to um, when you load the trees for your city. So um, it, the, we can maybe it might make sense to move this um, test data point because that's it zooms you right into the middle of nowhere. Um, but for example, for the different cities. Um, Salem, for example, if I click on the Salem point and load the trees for Salem, it'll zoom me right um, into Salem. And so for all the different city points, um, you'll, it'll just automatically zoom you to where that um, yellow point is. Um, and so 
that I think that's kind of getting at your question there, um, the different home extents for the different cities. And for those from Salem who are seeing this, those points are around the Oregon Department of Forestry and they're the ones that that Emma and I were entering just to play around with the system. So don't think they're on your inventory. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Cindy asks, in the tree information, is there a free text notes field or similar to add other details about the tree, such as age, historical significance, et cetera? Is the field searchable and can photographs of the tree be added? Yep. Um, we have the kind of open text field at the bottom here of the tree information tab um, that you can type into. And it is, um, it's searchable. It's, you would use the advanced filter um, to filter down to trees with specific um, notes in there. Um, so that's how you would populate that and then search for specific notes in the future, um, filter down to trees with those notes. Um, and then right below the, that note section is actually the photo. So um, you can either choose to add photos directly from like your device's gallery, or you can, um, if you have a device with you that is, can take photos, it'll prompt you to take a photo at that time. You choose, choose files. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Jeff asks, do you have to inspect the tree right after you submit it to lock it? Okay, wait a second. Do you have to inspect the tree right after you submit it to lock in that first DBH into the inspection record? Um, nope, that's another good question. Um, first time you add into the system, um, you'll just fill out your whole details form. And like I said, no need to hit save or anything um, like that as you go through. Um, when you come back for your very first inspection um, and fill out the inspection form and update the, the values, um, it once you submit that one the very first time, it basically pulls all the current information and saves it as a record and then um, updates the information for the, um, the new information. Okay, um, let's see, I'm trying to get, keep everything squared away here. Um, Tina asks, is the condition metric, fair, good, dead, defined the same for all cities? Um, yes, so all of the fields in here and, and their drop down values um, will look the same for all of the different cities. Um, so let me scroll down, here's the condition. Um, values that will look the same for every city. So it's, it's going to look the same for every city, but um, but I, I'm wondering if she means uh, whether or not there's like a, a written description of what a fair condition tree is, a good condition tree is, so that it can be compared from city to city, or whether cities themselves determine what a fair, good, excellent tree is. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so that's kind of up to you, Kristen, and how you want it to work, but we can definitely put um, under this condition field in this space here some descriptions for what it means to be an excellent tree um, or different uh, qualifi qualifiers for the condition values um, or if you want the cities to be able to um, manage that on their own. Um, I think, it makes, I think it makes sense to try to um, define it for everyone just so that we can compare apples to apples when the time comes. Um, so, so we'll, we'll um, work on that a little bit, tweak that a little bit. Um, so Jeff is just confirming here, um, only accessible via browser, sorry, only accessible via browser on a mobile device, no app. That's correct, yep. Um, no need to download an app. Um, just whatever browser you use, you can access it. Okay. Um, Patricia asks, what is the long-term plan for this data? Will the state keep paying for this system? So the, the way it's gonna work is that this um, uh, project has been funded for three years. 
um, and um, and we'll hopefully continue it with the money that we have for at least another fourth year. Um, and then um, we're going to prioritize at the state level of um, continuing to support the system. What we don't know yet, frankly, is um, whether in any given year we will have enough money to do it or whether we'll have to go to a cost share system. And then the other option would be that as cities get more comfortable with this, you'll find that there are um, that there are options with Planet Geo, other bells and whistles that, that each city might want to add themselves and actually have their own individual contract with Planet Geo to continue this as well. But in any case, the data will is ours. Um, if for whatever reason we cannot continue with Planet Geo, we can probably do something within the Department of Forestry itself, um, because we've got a lot of uh, really good GIS folks here. Um, but at this point, the plan is, at least for the next three to four years, and, and hopefully beyond, that we'll be working with this system and with this company. So I hope that answers the question. And Patricia, if it doesn't answer your question, I hope that you will um, submit another question. Um, so let's see. Um, Tina um, likes the fact that we're looking for definitions of the condition classes, so we'll definitely work on that. Uh, uh, Jeff uh, asks, um, for small cities who don't have many tree experts but quite a few passionate volunteers, are there any tools you might recommend for help with tree identification? Is this intended to be limited to city staff versus tree committees or city volunteers. And the way, as, as you will see in the FAQ document, it really is up to the cities how they would um, like to do that, whether they want to use city staff time, uh, whether they have a, a core of volunteers that they um, feel are trainable and reliable and all of that kind of stuff. Um, there are a variety of, of ways that um, urban forestry staff is expecting to um, do outreach with you guys, either on-site outreach uh, as well as Zoom type outreach. We can actually do quite a bit of um, plant ID via Zoom if necessary, if this pandemic goes on and on and on. Um, and so there are a variety of different options for cities depending on what their specific situation is. The one thing that we can't do is that at this point we don't have staff to come out and do the inventory for you, but we can certainly work with whatever group or staff or whomever you want to work on the inventory. Um, let's see. Um, Zach asks, how much effort would it take to input an existing inventory in ArcMap into TreePlotter? Would it likely require modifying a lot of data fields to get them to match? Yep, that's a good question. Um, and we'll either touch on that uh, topic next week or in its own maybe um, webinar video to go over the uploader tool, which I briefly mentioned, but it, that's exactly what it was built for is to um, take tree data um, out of a GIS system. So it takes either a shape file or a CSV file and um, kind of walks you through the process of um, bringing that data into the system. And so for um, any fields that look a little bit different than the fields that we have set up in here, it kind of walks you through um, mapping your different values to the values we have here in TreePlotter. Um, if it's just text or number fields, those will just copy over. Um, but yep, you can do that all with the uploader tool. Okay. Um, so I think those are all the questions that I see. Um, just checking to make sure I haven't forgotten anybody. Um, okay. Um, so maybe uh, I see it's uh, 226, so this is almost done. Um, maybe, uh, Charlie, could you say a couple things about what we might be looking at next week? Uh, like maybe the management plan or possibly yep. the tree walk or whatever. Yeah, so let's 
Um, so next week we're gonna, like I've mentioned, touch on some of the um, other components and tools in the system that live in this hub menu. Um, one thing that Kristen and I have been working on is a management plan that um, cities will be able to just basically run with the click of a button um, and get some stats and um, charts um, directly out of the system. So let me just let me just quickly pull up what it'll look like. Um, so in this case, you'll load up the city um, and the trees that you um, want to get the information for. Um, you just click this one button, run report. Um, and it will pull up charts, graphs, numbers um, for your specific um, city. So we're still kind of tweaking this and um, messing with it, but this um, you'll see once we go down here. So it's different charts, counts, um, percentages, um, all uh, specific to um, the city um, that you're running this on. So we'll go into some of this reporting. Um, some of the other uh, data tools, um, uploader, uh, mass updater, and maybe we'll even touch on, Kristen, we can touch the EAB calculator as well at that time. Cool, cool. Um, so there is a question of when can folks get started uh, doing this? Um, I would say uh, wait until next week to get started on your own community, but in the meantime, start playing with the, the demo um, and see what what you encounter and how it works for you and um, and then uh, I think after that after next week um, we'll have we'll just have sort of like a, a a way of I guess signing up for um, for I think probably the best thing to do would maybe to organize a uh, a zoom meeting just with the folks who are interested in getting started with me and Katie and, and other uh, urban forestry staff or whatever um, talk about where you guys are all at. Um, I don't know yet whether it should be a one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with people who are interested or uh, a group in, a group uh, Zoom like this. Um, but we'll, we'll work it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So, so I see that the number of questions hasn't changed. I think all the chats let me make sure the chats. Is, um, okay. Oh, here's one. Um, just a very quick question. I realize we're almost at time. Um, if a city is using their own inventory system, how and how frequently do we give you that that update data? And I I think it's whenever they want, right? Yeah. Um, we can discuss how often uh, we want to do new uploads, um, but I don't think we have a time frame or set time frame for that mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah, especially once all the crosswalking has been done, it should be pretty easy. So, okay. Um, well, I see it is 2.30. Um, thank you, Charlie. I appreciate your expertise and your willingness to meet with us today. And, um, oh, I see one last Q&A. Um, okay. I don't see where it is. Oh, there's a thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, I hope you guys will come back for next week. Uh, remember, you have to register um, so that we don't get hacked or anything on this Zoom platform. And, um, and if you have any questions in the meantime, uh, contact me. Uh, I think most of you have my email address at this point, kristin.ramstad at oregon.gov. And we'll hopefully see you all next week. Do you have anything else to say, Charlie? Nope, I think that's it. Okay. Sounds good. See you next week. Thank you. Bye.